I am Steve Fall, and welcome to NBC Sports Boston. And today, we have a very special guest. It's Wardlow. Wardlow, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well after the other night. Not doing as well as I usually am, but uh, sure we'll discuss that. Yes, that's actually my first question for you. So, you know, recently on an episode of AEW Dynamite, you were about to win the TNT Championship, but your former colleague MJF cost you the belt. Oh, what is next for this rivalry between you and MJF? You know, a couple of weeks ago, I told Max, I hope you're as intelligent as you claim to be. And he would release me from my contract and we can go our separate ways. Uh, clearly, he is not as intelligent as he claims to be, uh, because after last night, um, or after the other night, you know, that was my my time, my moment to win the title, and that would have changed my life. Um, so now I'm taking my focus away from winning titles, and my only focus is to make MJF's life hell. I like that answer. That's a, that's a good, strong answer because he, de he deserves it for what happened. But for almost two years, you and MJF were together, uh, colleagues, running buddies, doing things together. But outside of the ring, like, what is your relationship like outside of the characters in the, the, the fighting that we see on TV? Um, what you see from MJF on TV isn't only MJF behind the scenes. I would dare to say he's worse behind the scenes. Damn. So you think the things he says in front of millions of people is bad. You should hear the things he says in front of a small group of people. So yeah, uh, after traveling for a couple of years with him, uh, I can genuinely say he's just not a good person. I have seen pictures of him giving children the middle finger. So uh, it's insane. Some of the things I witnessed. He's a, uh, he's one of, I guess one of a kind is uh, the kind way to, to say it. One of a kind, but so, but right now you're, you're, you're kind of running by yourself. You were with MJF, you were, the, the, you were in a faction, but now you're on your own. Like, how does it make you feel? Do you feel like possibly there's soon enough going to be a rocket strapped to your back and you're going to go straight to the top? Or are you feeling a little nervous and timid about this journey on your own? Oh, I am. I am never more comfortable than I am when I'm alone. Um, I, it's, you know, that's just kind of been my thing my whole life. I've been a little bit of a loner. I've never been scared to, uh, you know, I spent many, many years in seclusion trying to make my dreams come true. So I've never been scared to go to the movie theaters alone, take myself out for a nice steak dinner. I mean, normally I eat dinner alone. I mean, that's just, you know, it's funny, like when we were in catering, you know, I, I get my food and I just find the empty table. And that's not, um, it's not because I don't like people or I, you know, I necessarily want to be alone. It's just what I'm accustomed to. And that's my go-to. My go-to is to be alone. If somebody invites me over, I'll go over. But my, my, my go-to is to be alone. So I'm very excited to be on my own because I, I know what I can accomplish on my own when I'm focused on myself. And uh, I think, I think I am the rocket now. I love it. I love it. Now, recently you did win a six man ladder match at the most recent AEW pay-per-view revolution. Now, how do you even prepare for something like that? Because in my brain, I don't think when you go to wrestling school, the first day of school is like, all right, let's run the ropes, learn how to bump. And oh, by the way, um, here's a ladder, fall off it. Yeah, when you when you start dealing with tables, ladders, chairs, steel cages, thumbtacks, yeah, there's no there's no day in wrestling school where we empty out a bag of thumbtacks and go, all right, you know, fall into those in the proper way. There is no proper way, you know. The those things hurt, you know. You should see my back right now. My my back looks like uh, a red, black, and blue piece of art from the steel. That Sean Spears introduced to it. Um, 
you know, it hurts. I, I, I have multiple injuries that I'm working through fighting through right now from the ladder match. Uh, the, the, my only grace with the ladder match was I had been on ladders my whole life. Uh, you know, I grew up a Hardy boys fan. I grew up during the era of the TLC matches. So I, I was very comfortable again, going into that ladder match, just because I do have a lot of experience on a ladder. So did you like many wrestling fans have a backyard wrestling federation? Oh, of course I did. Oh, of course I did. Did you have a special wrestling name? I, I always tried to be Shawn Michaels. My name is Steve. So I was always I was like, I'm sexy Steve. That, that was like my wrestling gimmick, who was pretty much was Shawn Michaels. <laughs> <laughs> sexy Steve. That dude. The did, sexy did the Steve dance. Oh, uh, yeah. Over. Super over. Um, yeah. Well, my first wrestling name was M Dog. <laughs> 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 I, actually you know what i think you're the first person to ever ask me that i think nice. that's the first i had to answer that question yes my my first backyard wrestling name was m dog and my big rival was jay-z <laughs> <laughs> his, his initials were jay-z and my first m so yeah super creative that's outstanding. Yeah. I, and again, me and my friends used to have our old camcorder and we'd re videotape them and we would, oh, yeah. we, you know, you watch them after and you're like, oh, look how amazing things. But yes, many, Hard you brought the Hardy Boys, like many Hardy Boy moments where you're like, I can totally do, be on my trampoline and leapfrog over a ladder and leg drop my friend on the ground. Um, it really hurt. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> and, and you're doing it now. Uh, you know, on a larger scale, obviously, and involving wrestlers like Keith Lee and Orange Cassidy. And man, I just got to say, like, I don't know how you do it. And you obviously you just mentioned your back is busted and, and hurting. And so, you know, thank you for your service of falling up those ladders. And, and you won. You won the giant uh, brass ring, which people still compare to the Sonic the Hedgehog ring. Has anyone said that to you ever in AEW? They're like, hey, that looks like Sonic the Hedgehog's ring. Uh, yeah, Sonic is the most common comment, but yeah, I've heard it all on Twitter. Yeah, of course. People are talking about the golden ring, but yes, I don't think a lot of people comprehend that it represents the brass ring yeah. that historically is uh, a big part of wrestling, but, uh, but yeah, the brass ring guys, it's not a Sonic ring. It's yes, it's, it is the brass ring. It's symbolic in many ways. And you brought up Twitter, so I'll have to ask my Twitter question now. Then, online, there seems to be a war between AEW and WWE fans. Boy, they do not like each other. But is that the same way it is in the locker room? Do the AEW wrestlers feel like they're at war with the WWE superstars? I can't. So, A, I don't, I try not to pay too much attention to what people are saying on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have seen a little bit of that interaction. Uh, I can't speak for everyone else in the locker room. Myself personally, um, I, I, I don't feel like we're necessarily in any type of a war. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if we were going head to head with Monday Night Raw or going head to head with SmackDown, maybe then. Um, but realistically, I just feel like we're two completely different products. Uh, you know, one product does entertainment, one does professional wrestling. And I just, I, I think it's almost hard to even compare the two. I, I feel, I truly feel like we are in our own league. No, I, I, I'm glad you said that because there are a lot of people who just, you know, it's the same thing. It's, oh, it's a fruit. So it must be the same thing. Apples and oranges comparing each other, but well, let, let's get local for a second. AEW. Well, oh, also, yep. yeah. On that, like, people also need to understand you can like both. Yes. Like, you can like both. <laughs> you know, I like bananas and oranges. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> no, you can't like bananas and oranges. You only can choose one, Wardlow. So pick one yeah. now, and that's the end. Uh. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm so happy that you've actually answered uh, in a, a, a demeanor that I thought I'd get. So I'm just happy you said that. But let's get local for a second. AEW is coming to Boston April 6th. And this is NBC Sports Boston. So what can fans expect when they attend an AEW event live? 
you know, I always say AEW is like every form of entertainment rolled into one. Uh, you get a concert with the loud music, you get a light show, there's pyros, um, you know, you get comedy, you get drama, there's athleticism, there's fighting, there's combat. Um, you know, especially with AEW, there's acrobats, um, acrobatics. It's just, it's every single form of entertainment rolled into this one giant, bright, loud, shiny roller coaster. And uh, for people that never go to wrestling shows and I hear them say, oh, this is my first wrestling event. They always follow with, I had so much more fun than I thought. I'll come back again. You know, for even if you're not a wrestling fan, it's still a great show to go check out. Cool. Now, of course, I am from New England, so I'm very biased. But who is your favorite New England sports team? Of course, we have the Patriots, the Red Sox, the Bruins, the Celtics, the Revolution. Which one is your choice? Um, I don't have like a favorite like sports team necessarily. Um, I, man, this none of the, this was the, no the this was the nutcracker. <laughs> no, no offense, but none of them. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, this man. interview is over. It's over. Heel, heel turn right there. Oh Boston. god! I know you just turned face. Now you turn heel again. What's your what's your yeah. problem? Boston out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when you do come to Boston, is there a special place you like to go? Because I know a lot of wrestlers love to go to the Chinese food restaurant Kalu's. So, uh, the last time we were in Boston was actually my first time ever in Boston. And uh, it was a very quick trip. I unfortunately, I remember getting to Boston and I actually told my friend, like, this place is gorgeous. Like, this is actually like, I, I just, I don't know why I wasn't expecting it to be, but it was somewhere where I was like, wow, I would really like to explore this place more. And hopefully I get that chance to this trip because uh, I haven't had the opportunity yet to really explore Boston. Um, but I'm very curious. What was that place called? called Kowloon's. Kowloon's? And what, yeah, Kowloon's. What it's in Saugus. It's right, it's right outside of Boston. But it, it is a place where if, when you go there, there's a small little hallway when you walk in, and there's autographs from everyone, from Macho Man to The Rock to Hulk Hogan. Everyone has been there before. And that's where, at least the WWE, when, when I was younger, after a lot of events, that's where all the wrestlers would go. So that's where fans suddenly figured out, oh, that's where all the wrestlers go, so all the fans will go. And it became quite a, a spot when I was younger. No kidding. I didn't even know that. So, yeah, that I'm going to plan on making a trip there for sure. I think they'll be very happy to hear that because they are huge wrestling fancy owners of Kowloon's. And um, they're just a big, uh, the Kowloon crew. Uh, so they're, they're, they're good people there. But um, let's move on, though. I know there's a question everyone wants me to ask, so I'm going to have to ask it now. The demeanor backstage, what was it like when you heard the news of Cody and Brandy Rhodes leaving or no, actually no longer working for AEW? I was very surprised. Um, I was very taken back by it. And I just, I'm still slightly taken back by it. I don't really know any of the details on anything, what really led to it how this even came about. It just, it really seemed like one day everything was great. And the next day they were gone. Hmm. Um, the, the, the only thing I can say about the situation is I've known Cody for three years and I've never once had a negative experience with him. And I've never once seen somebody have a negative experience with him. Uh, Cody is a big reason, a big reason I'm sitting here talking to you today and uh, I have nothing but love and respect for Cody. And if his decision to leave AEW was the best decision for him and his family, I 100% support it. Okay. Now, your AEW debut match was against Cody. Uh, was it February 19, 2020 in a steel cage match? And a lot of fans, including me, really feel like this match and the imagery in this match put AEW kind of in the forefront on the map because everyone knew kind of about it, 
But really, I think this match signified like, oh, that wow, this is this is real. This is staying. This is good. What do you say to fans who believe like your match with Cody really set the tone for AEW moving forward? Well, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I would love to think that our our match had that big of an impact, uh, and if it did, uh, man, I mean, that's really all you can ask for. Uh, but it was. It's wild that that was my first match, especially on live TV ever. Uh, and and I just, it was so intense and, and there was so much anticipation. Like the whole match is kind of a blackout for me. Uh, don't really recall much. Um, but looking back on it, it's still something I'm extremely proud of. Uh, I'm more than happy that my first match was with Cody in that cage. Uh, it most definitely set the tone for my entire career. And it started me off on the right foot. So, yeah, the cage match will always be one of the best nights of my life. February, like you said, February 19th, 2020, will always be one of the best nights of my life. Yep. Uh, it will always be one of my favorite matches. Awesome, because especially because about, you know, what, two, three weeks later, the entire country shuts down. So you got to, you got to perform in sort of a pretty large audience. And then for quite a long time, there were no fans. And what was that like performing in front of – you had empty arenas, and then you started having some of your performance on the outside kind of creating some sort of ambient noise. So what was that like? That made me question everything. You know, it was – I got my dreams came true much later than I anticipated in life. So it's, I finally made it. I'm finally wrestling in arenas packed with people. This is it. And then the pandemic happens. And it's one of those moments where you're like, you know, what if, what if the world doesn't bounce back from this? What if I finally made my dreams come true and now just as quickly they are over it, it was a very scary feeling. I'm happy I got that experience in front of that live crowd because, yeah, that was the that was the only match I had in front of a live crowd until COVID was over. And it was very odd uh, walking out with, you know, an empty arena and trying to perform with no noise is the weirdest thing wrestler will ever do. I mean, the crowd is such a part of the show. The crowd is the show. Uh, so <laughs> when you slam somebody and you look up and it's just crickets, it's a very unique thing, but I'm very proud of, of myself and everybody on the roster that fought through that and still performed like they were in an arena full of 10, 20,000 people. I mean, people still gave it their all, uh, with, with no one in the crowd. Yeah, yeah, I remember watching, I watched the entire run of AEW so far, and I, yeah, it was very strange to have no fans there, but you're right, it suddenly became like a TV show versus a wrestling program, because suddenly you had to cater to the audience at home more so than ever before, you were obviously, but at the same time, you had an audience to gauge what you're doing in the match, is it working out, well, the fans in the arena will tell you, hey, boo, I don't like this, so right. it's bizarre, I would think. Yeah, so maybe maybe a little underlining, it gave people an opportunity to focus a little more on the camera work and, and entertaining the crowd at home. So yep. maybe, you know, find the positive in it. But yeah, but yeah, it's the live crowd that really, you know, tells you what's working and what's not or who they like and who they don't. You know, for two years, we didn't really, you know, we really didn't know who, <laughs> who people liked. Yep. We were just going out. Well, uh, I think the ratings definitely showed that people were enjoying the product because, you know, breaking over a million constantly and, and hitting demographics that you want to hit, I think, is a, a huge, hey, we're doing something right. If the ratings are showing and the demographics are showing, that everything seems to be going in the right direction. Um, but let's move on, though. What's your relationship like with Tony Khan? Uh, do you have any funny stories or uh, interactions with him you can share? Um. I don't have, like, a super personal relationship with Tony. Um, you know, we're cordial. We, we talk, we, you know, we've, we've had some great conversations, uh, but Tony, he's just, Tony's just a normal dude. He's just a, a good hearted, normal, kind man. And, and he's, 
super passionate. He is extremely passionate about this business and he's so hands-on with all of it. And he's so involved. Um, he, he spreads himself paper thin. Um, and it's just, it, it's amazing to see somebody so involved and, and cares so much and just truly wants the best for everybody. And, and I call, I call Tony the dream maker um, because he is, man, he, he's made so many people's dreams come true. He's changed so many people's lives. I mean, just mine alone. He's made uh, multiple dreams come true of mine and, and, and I'm sure there's more to come. Um, I, I'm, I 100% believe he's going to give me the opportunity to fulfill everything I want to do. And uh, it's just amazing to see what he does for everybody in the locker room and in the company as a whole. Great man to work for. Nice. Well, speaking of dreams, you know, who is your dream opponent currently in AEW or even WWE? Like, who would you like to face in, in either organization? You work for one, obviously, but the forbidden door seems to be something we all talk about constantly. So maybe it could be opened. I, I, uh, I invite Brock Lesnar over to AEW anytime he wants. That's uh, that's up there on the dream list. But my dreams in AEW, Kenny Omega is at the top of that list. Um, Andrade, uh, Pac. Like I, I think those are the top three. In my opinion, those are those are three of the best wrestlers in the world. And I live to be challenged. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to be challenged. I, I love to challenge myself. I love to see what I can accomplish, what I can overcome. So I would like to step in the ring with those three to really test myself. Man, those be some, those are badass matches that they can happen. Uh, if anyone's, if anyone's listening, uh, you know, uh, book it, <laughs> book it. Uh, I got two more questions for you though. Oh, one is what inspired you to become a wrestler? You mentioned you had a backhand wrestling federation. So I'm assuming it, at a young age, we're watching professional wrestling. Yeah, it, it all started with Brett the Hitman Hart. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he was the first one, uh, you know, when I saw him on TV for the first time. There he is. I got oh, it. Oh, you got it here? I was like, I got, it, I got it. There's Brett. <laughs> oh, my. That's the, that's the figure. That's the one I had when I was a kid. This is Series 1 with uh, Jax came out. Yeah, with a, the little bone. The little yeah. bone. Oh yeah, the bone crunch. I even got my razor here. Yes. Oh, oh my yes, sir. God. Yeah. Oh yeah. I probably have all your action figures here, and we'll just bust out one more Owen Hart too. Did you have the Ultimate Warrior in that one? Of that course. Series? I got. Oh, I got yeah. a whole. Listen. If you what you see behind you is a piece, a piece of my yes. life. My if, if my wife would allow me, which she won't, they would. It would be all over the house. My children would be playing with all my toys, and then I'd be like, "Don't touch that." That's not a toy. It's a collectible. <laughs> but yeah, he was, uh, for me, Bret Hart was the first one that really captivated me. And I, I just remember as a kid, the only thing, I, well, there's two things I really wanted as a kid. One was a Batmobile, super realistic, yes. The other was to be sitting front row at a wrestling show and have Bret Hart come and put those shades on me. Um, unfortunately grew up very poor. So I didn't get to my first wrestling show until I was like 13, which was well past Bret Hart's time. Uh, but as a kid, that was all I wanted. And, uh, and, and I just remember thinking Bret Hart was the coolest and, and he made me believe his selling oh was so good. Like as a kid, you, you had no choice but to believe. And I think that's what, what was so special about Brett and why you hear so many people speak so highly of him. It's true. Um, any, anytime there's a question online of the, uh, the, the, you know, Shawn Michaels or Bret Hart conversation, and it's always like, well, I like Shawn Michaels, but like Bret Hart maybe believe and, and he sold, he just said he sold everything. He, he, everything he did in the ring, there was a reason for doing it. It didn't feel like he was going to do something just to be flashy. He, he wasn't flashy, even though he wore pink and, and, and wore those sunglasses that would never protect you from the sun. But the, he was still was impressive. I had a pair of those glasses. Um, I bought them. You know, my parents probably bought them for me on like shop when I did not didn't exist then. But, you know, their website, right. which probably also didn't exist. You had to call a number back in the day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
mom, dad, put your hello. Um, one final question though, what, Orlo, what is your goal for the rest of the year? What is look, what's the future look like? Dude, my goal is to get, is to give Max what he deserves and get myself out of that contract. My goal is to become officially 100% AEW and then just take over the company and take over the business. I, um, my major goal with AEW is to just bring it into the mainstream media light. Uh, I remember growing up, professional wrestling was cool. From kids to teens to adults, it was cool. We would go to school. People were talking about what happened at the pay-per-view. Teachers were talking about it. I mean, you would see it on the news. It was, it was this huge thing. And I truly believe that myself and a lot of other individuals in AEW have the ability, have the talent, have that superstar status to bring professional wrestling back into that light and make it cool again. And I just want to make AEW as successful as possible get as many eyes on it, get that demographic and just make pro wrestling cool again. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I, I agree. You used to go to gas stations and suddenly, and suddenly a gas station, see like an NWO t-shirt and you're like, what? Yeah. It, it was, it was everywhere. It, it, even Beanie Babies were a big thing at one point and wrestling Beanie Babies were made. That's, <laughs> that's how crazy wrestling was at one point. I, I agree with you. I've been a fan since a child and, you know, let's let's get a shirt that says "Let's make wrestling cool again." I, I think that'd be nice. Absolutely, it's always been cool to me. But to some people on the outside world, they don't believe the same things. But thank you so much, though, Warlow, for being here talking about MJF. You're you're back at a wrestling federation. I have your name. We finally have his name. <laughs> I'm so happy to. So thank you again for being here, and um, thanks again for uh, talking with me. Bye. No problem. I appreciate it.